Now, this doesn't stop us from trying to step into another person's shoes. And this is the notion of empathy, which is something our brains do automatically. Empathy is our brain's ability to simulate what someone else is going through. And researchers typically divide this into emotional empathy, which is your ability to share the emotional experiences of someone else, and cognitive empathy, understanding the other person's perspective or their mental state. Now, even though empathy seems like just a feeling you experience, it's, of course, under the hood, a biological algorithm. Now, you may have heard of mirror neurons, which are neurons that become active when you perform some action and also when you see someone else do that same action. I mention these because many people erroneously think that the mirror neuron system is the basis of empathy. But in fact, empathy involves much more than that because you also need a whole collection of regions that integrate emotional information and social information and tell you what are the really salient things to pay attention to. So nowadays you can put together hundreds of brain imaging studies, fMRI, to see that there's a whole network of brain regions that come online when you're considering the emotions of another person. Regions like the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex and the amygdala and the inferior frontal gyrus. Okay, the details don't matter for today's purpose, except to say that all these areas consistently come online during tasks that require you to simulate another person's state. Like if you see them experience pain or distress, even though you're not experiencing that, your brain runs the simulation. Now, why do we have such a rich system for simulating other people in our heads? It's because biologically, empathy is not just a nice to have, it's a survival tool. It helps us connect and cooperate and parent and navigate the complexities of social life. And in that sense, it's not just emotional intelligence we're talking about, it's neural engineering evolved for living together in large groups. And this is why we flinch when we see someone else in pain, and also why laughter spreads so easily through a crowd. It's because when we witness another person's emotional state, our brains simulate it, creating a kind of inner echo of what they're feeling. It's not the real thing, but it's a rough sketch. And this capacity for empathy is very useful for what's known as theory of mind, which I talked about in episode 72. This is the cognitive ability to understand that other people have thoughts and feelings and perspectives different from yours. Little kids don't have theory of mind, but it develops through early childhood. And that moment when a toddler realizes that another mind is not the same as theirs, this marks the beginning of perspective taking. This is the foundation of social connection and storytelling and even deception. Because without theory of mind, you'd be stuck in your own mental bubble. And by the way, having good theory of mind is something we keep refining our whole lives. Some people become especially fluent in it, especially people like actors or therapists or even parents. Other people struggle with theory of mind, not because they're cruel, but because the skill of imagining someone else's internal world takes practice and effort and humility and the right kind of neural circuitry. So we are a species who tries to model one another. We try to step into each other's shoes, but we're really not so good at it. Mostly, we just assume that everyone else is like us on the inside. But when you really look at empathy, you can see that what we're really doing is imposing our models on what we think the other person is feeling. As a really good example of this, I've noticed this with videos of robots produced by a company called Boston Dynamics. You might have seen these. They're these robots that look like metal dogs. And one of the things the company wanted to show is that these dogs are robust against being knocked off course. So the robot dog is running forward in the video and someone comes out and kicks it. And the robot's legs do a quick scramble, and even though it tilts to the side, it manages to stay upright, and it keeps going, which is very impressive. But here's the thing. I've seen dozens of people watch these videos, and they wince 
their empathy is stoked. And I get it. It looks like a creature. It looks like a sentient being and it's getting kicked. It's really difficult to watch this and not feel an empathic sting. But I think what this illustrates is our propensity to imagine that other things feel the way we do, even when there's really no good reason to imagine that we're looking at anything other than a collection of nuts and bolts and wires in the case of this robot. So in other words, our feelings of empathy are a massively important part of our success as a species, but the details presumably say more about us than they do about the accuracy of the feeling. In other words, how much your assumptions about the inner life of the other is right on target. I'll give you another example of the weirdness of this. Our responses to reading or watching fiction. One of the classes I teach at Stanford is called Literature and the Brain. And an issue I always talk about with amazement is the fact that we shed tears or we laugh out loud or we worry or we agonize over the pain of somebody else, someone we know is not real. You're reading about, let's say, Jon Snow in Game of Thrones, and you're aware that the whole world he's in isn't even real. The author can tell us, look, this is fiction. There can be a giant sign in front of you that says, this is a string of words depicting a world that is totally made up, and it won't stop tears running down your cheek when something bad happens to Jon Snow. Now, I'll come back to literature and empathy in a moment because I think literature is one of our most important tools for expanding the fence lines of our empathy. But for now, I'm just making the point that simply because you feel that someone else must be feeling the same thing you are, you might be talking about a robot or an explicitly made up character and you'll still impose what you believe is this is what that person must be feeling. And obviously it's not just with robots or fictional characters. We empathize more with people we assume are more like us. And that might not be accurate. So in episode 20, I talked about neuroimaging experiments in my lab where we put people into the brain scanner and we showed them six hands. And one of the hands gets selected by the computer and you see that hand get stabbed with a syringe needle. This activates a network in your brain that we summarize as the pain matrix. And as I mentioned before, this is the neural basis of empathy. You're having this fireworks show in your brain light up, even though it wasn't your hand that got stabbed. You're just watching someone else's hand. And yet you are simulating the pain involved. But here's the key thing. We then labeled each hand with a one word label, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Scientologist, atheist, Hindu, and now the computer picks the hands one at a time and you see them get stabbed with the syringe needle. And the question is, do you care as much if it's any of the members of your out group versus the label of your in group? So we studied 105 people on this and the answer was clear. Your brain has a large empathic response when you see the hand with your group label get stabbed and it just doesn't muster the same degree of response when it's anyone else getting stabbed. And this was equally true across all the groups, including the atheists, who cared more when they saw the atheist hand get stabbed. So, in earlier episodes, I talked all about the meaning of this from a societal point of view, but for today, I wanna to emphasize that whatever your religion is or your non-religion, there are literally millions or billions of people who belong to that label too with you, and they are all as different as can be, and the spread is enormous. And so the idea that you would care for those millions of people more than other millions of people suggests, again, that your empathy is not so much about climbing into someone else's head, but instead about imposing your model onto the external world. 